My name is Brittany Smith. I'm the Education Director at Claire House. Um, I just want to um, take a few minutes to do a welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Quarantique, When Will It End? Um, this year, our normally three evening in-person community conversation series has been adapted like much of our normal and is being presented on Zoom. So we're so happy that you're here to share in this conversation. So now I would like to introduce Kelly Scott. She is the founder and executive director of Claire House, which provides a loving home and compassionate care for people in their final days and weeks of life. She has been caring for dying people throughout her 32 years of being a nurse and just has a real heart for people. Um, she's also the board president of Omega Home Network, which is a national membership organization of homes like Claire House across the U.S. And through that role, Kelly frequently provides consulting and mentoring to aspiring projects and open homes, both locally and nationally. And she's a dedicated leader and throughout this pandemic has been a role model to many in leading through chaos and crisis. Uh, she has a dog named Boomer and loves fishing Montana rivers with uh, while visiting her sons. So, Kelly? So, I appreciate that lovely introduction. Um, one of the most amazing things about my job is being able to work with all of these amazing women that are a part of this program tonight, and I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to know them, and um, some of them as long as for the last 20 plus years. So, um, this is a real treat for me to introduce you to my friends and colleagues and be able to share their wisdom with you. Um, as Brittany mentioned, Clearhouse does provide a loving home for dying people in need throughout Northeastern Oklahoma. And we've been doing this now for 17 years and we've learned a lot and we have a lot to share. And we launched an education program several years ago to try to reach community members at large to try to reach students in healthcare discipline training and to try to help spread our model that we believe is so critical for completing the continuum of care at life's end. And we um, have been doing this series now for four or five years. So obviously, it's the first time we've done it virtually. Um, and as much as we love to be together in person, in the weird times that we're living in right now, it's somewhat um, of a relief to me to be in a platform where we can all see each other's faces because if we were together, we wouldn't be able to do that. So um, I've been scrolling through all the boxes and looking at everybody that um, has been kind enough to turn their cameras on. And I'm just, if I haven't seen you for a while, I'm really happy to see you. And um, I hope that you're uh, gonna get something out of this format that we have planned for you tonight. So I'm going to introduce our panel and uh, let you know who these gals are. Um, first is Dr. Jill Warnock. Now, Dr. Warnock moved with her family to Tulsa in 1993 to work as a professor of psychiatry at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, where she taught medical students and residents for over 20 years. While completing her MD, her residency, and her PhD, she has been a Tennessee volunteer, a Washington University Bear, and a Kansas Jayhawk. Jill is a national speaker in areas of psychopharmacology and women's health, a prolific writer, and a researcher in the areas of depression, anxiety disorders, and hormone-related mood disorders. Currently, Jill and her husband, Dr. Jim Guerin, provide consultation, education, and support to Clarehouse guests and staff. And she wanted to let us all know that as the pandemic has turned most of our lives topsy-turvy, Jill and her husband care full time for their 19 month old grandniece in an effort to keep their family members safe from the virus. Next is Dr. Jennifer Clark, educated at the University of Kansas and trained at the Medical University of South Carolina and the Harvard Fellowship in Palliative Care Education and Practice. Dr. Clark has been in the world of healthcare for over 20 years. With MedPeds training and board certification in the subspecialty of hospice and palliative medicine, Dr. Clark is a physician and healthcare delivery scientist serving in various roles as a clinical educator, administrator, and innovator at local, national, and international levels. Jen seeks to challenge our society's definition of health, which she defines as the skill set and experience of living a human life. 
Locally, in addition to her volunteer role at Clearhouse, Dr. Clark is currently part of the OSU Project ECHO team addressing the COVID-19 pandemic in Oklahoma. And last but not least is Wendy Thomas. Hi. Wendy has served as Executive Director of Leadership Tulsa since 2002. During that time, she's expanded its programs, services, financial resources, and staff, and staff in ways that increase its mission and impact. She's a graduate of the University of Tulsa and has a master's degree in arts administration from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Wendy is a seasoned nonprofit board leader, a frequent consultant to area organizations in the areas of board development, strategic planning, and team building, and is a former adjunct professor at the University of Tulsa. If you follow Wendy on social media, you know she loves, in no particular order, Tulsa, cats, and memes. So that's our panel. We are going to hear from each one of these women who will share their unique perspective on life in these extraordinary times. As we have done in marketing this program, we plan to explore these concepts with a communication tool that's exploded into our consciousness in recent years, the meme. We all have our favorites, but the hallmark of a good meme is the representation of a particular phenomenon or theme through symbolic meaning. And we'll utilize this tool to set the stage for our discussion. So Wendy's got, or Brittany's got my first little diagram up here. It's a Venn diagram, I believe, if you know that term. So when our world changes, whether it's a new baby, a job, or a relationship, or a pandemic, we have to do some sorting in our minds and hearts to thrive or even survive. This simple meme demonstrates the fairly narrow intersection of where we can spend our time and energy focused on the things that matter to us and are within the realm of our control. Our challenge in quarantine is to develop the skills to discern what matters and what doesn't amidst all the noise assaulting our senses every day. So looking at it another way, this meme captures a big picture of all that worries or concerns us the microcosm of what we can control, and the middle ground of how we make an impact and influence our world. Each panel is going to describe a circle, and we'll start with Dr. Jill. Thank you so much for that nice, uh, wonderful introduction. So yes, <clears throat> quarantine. What I'm going to talk about is how to respond rather than react. So quarantine, it's been with us now for almost seven months. And so there's so many challenges and losses of life and health and jobs and you know, disruptions of daily lives and loneliness. But how can we best keep ourselves stable and end on an even keel? How can we bring our best selves forward during this trying time? For me, the important skill is to develop and foster that sacred space, that special moment right before you, re you act that allows you to choose how you want to respond. You want to respond with kindness and grace rather than to impulsively react and perhaps react with a negative or harmful response to yourself or to those you care about. So we all want to respond with compassion and generosity to ourselves and to others. The end is near, I wish. How can we maintain resilience and well being during this stressful time? Well, bad news sells because the amygdala is always looking for something to fear. The amygdala is that part of the brain that hijacks us to focus on the negative. It's designed to protect us from those lions and tigers and bears, but really it's just really focusing on all that attention on that negative news, that negative news of the virus, the floods, the fires, the, the fires. So this, the amygdala makes our mind like a radio broadcasting, just doom and gloom. So how do we tame our amygdala? This amygdala, it's involved in processing all these fears and anxiety and negative and overwhelming feelings and concerns and, and can precipitate those panicky feelings and those freeze, fight and flight responses that 
we all have experienced. Well, the amygdala is an important part of the brain that activates the hypothalamus, that activates the adrenals, that secretes epinephrine, and that's that hormone that gets that sympathetic nervous system going that causes that increase in heart rate, that fear, that, that uh, increase in blood pressure, and, and all of those sickening feelings that we all know and share. But the good news is we can learn to tame our amygdala and develop new circuits in the brain. But guess what? It takes practice. That's why they call it a practice. So we're going to talk about some of these things that can uh, uh, enable us to respond rather than just to react. Now she suggests, oh, all you need to do is learn to relax. Well, sometimes it's harder than that. But I, wanted, I want to talk about breathing exercises just for a moment because there's many, 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 many different breathing exercises and I want you to Google them and I want you to try different ones and find which ones work for you. Like this is Andrew Wilde's four, seven, eight, where you breathe in for four counts, hold it for seven and exhale for eight and repeat as you need but always try to exhale longer than you inhale because that exhale is what stimulates, that long exhale stimulates the parasympathetic, which counteracts that sympathetic response, that, that fear and uh, response that we were talking about earlier. And these breathing exercises actually stimulate parasympathetic nervous system, which causes an activation of the GABA pathways in the prefrontal cortex of the brain and in the insula, which inhibits or quiets or tames the amygdala. Okay, we live most of our lives inside our head. Let's make sure it's a nice place to be. Well, I'm learning that it can be a nice place to be if we practice self-compassion, mindfulness, and resilience. Let's talk about self-compassion for just a moment. I don't know if you have heard of Christian Neff, but I hope you can. I hope you can learn about her and her research from the University of Texas. A moment of self-compassion can change your day and a string of such moments can change the course of your life. She's got several components to, to the practice of self-compassion. And the first is to be kind and warm and understanding towards ourselves. Don't you know that you would be nice and kind to someone else who's suffering or in, in pain or being overwhelmed? We can be so brutally judgmental and critical of ourselves. And that self-criticalness stimulates that, that alarm response that we were just talking about in the amygdala. That's why we need to try to change that. Now, her other point is, is about common humanity. If we realize and focus on the fact that suffering and feelings of inadequacy are part of a shared human experience and that this fosters, when you share, when you notice that you're sharing that feeling with others, it gives you a feeling of connection and that decreases loneliness. And you don't have to go this alone and that me ego isn't all alone and isolated. And lastly, she talks about mindfulness. And mindfulness takes a balanced approach to these negative emotions that we all experience. It neither allows them to be suppressed or exaggerated, but it allows them to pay attention to them and feel compassion for them at the same time. Because if we recognize our suffering, then we can be compassionate to ourselves. So we want to take that self-criticism and turn it offline, so to speak, and enter a sense of non-judgmentalness. So let me talk just for a moment of the basic orientation of mindfulness, where you're in the present moment, not in the future, not in the past. You take a non-judgmental approach to all those thoughts you have inside. And so you might be something like this. I practice this all the time. Oh, hello, anxiety. Oh, well, Yes, I see you again. Yes. Oh, yes, I notice you. Oh, yes, I see you. 
Yes, yes. Well, there you are again. Ah, oh, I'm just going to allow you to be there. Yep, go ahead. You can be there. But I can have my other feelings too. But I'm, I'll allow you to be there. You, you think you need to be there. Go right ahead. And then letting go and letting be. So let that anxiety be there. But there's also important to know that fear is the non-acceptance of uncertainty. Fear is the non-acceptance of uncertainty. So if we practice that letting go, let God, let the universe, and especially let go of the things we cannot control, we'll be a whole lot, <laughs> whole lot better. And this sort of shows some of the themes of today's presentation. But what can you control? That's what I wanted to focus on. Well, we can focus on these things in the circle. We can practice our breathing exercises when we get overwhelmed. We can practice our social distancing and, and choose our responses to be kind and compassionate and find fun things to do at home. And boy, oh boy, do we need to let go of those things that we cannot control. We cannot control the actions of others or if others are gonna follow the rules of social distancing and so forth. So focus on here the things that you, you can control. And, and also let's practice resilience. And I've summarized that in the three C's. First C, crap. Crap happens. <laughs> and suffering is just part of life. And you're not unique in that. And that's, and that's part of our shared common human condition. The other point, um, oh, this is like Lucy Hone's work. She um, is a researcher in resilience and has been studying resilience for 20 years. And she's a researcher both in uh, the United States and in New Zealand. And she has a fantastic TED talk if you're uh, at all interested in, in hearing what she has to say as well. But she also points out the second C is to choose. You can choose where you want to select or place your attention. Now those negative thoughts, they're sticky. And why are they sticky? Because they activate that amygdala and they just stick around and you might ruminate the same damn thought over and over or, or it just takes you down that rabbit hole of negative thoughts. On the other hand, Positive emotions are kind of bouncy. They bounce in, they give you a little bounce, and then they're gone. So how do we, how do we keep more positivity? Well, there's Barbara Fredrickson from the University of North Carolina, and she challenges us and encourages us to have repeated micro moments of positivity. What are micro, mo micro moments of positivity? These are just little brief moments from everyday activities that can buffer us from stress and negativity. The baby laughing, the bird singing, that intimate conversation, that lovely smile of a friend. These can buffer us from the stress and negativity and foster physical and mental health. And that brain, again, it has plasticity. That means it can change and generate cells and pathways to train new circuitry of the brain to promote those positive responses. And last C is consider. Think to yourself, is what I'm doing, thinking, feeling, sensing, imagining, helping, helping me or hurting me? Do I really need that third glass of wine or can I make a choice there? Or can I engage in activities that foster my positive emotions, such as doing good things for others and appreciating the world around you and enhancing relationships and establishing goals? And most importantly also, I think, is to foster that attitude of gratitude. And the yes and. This is so important. I can feel my pain, I can feel my sorrow, I can feel my disappointment, and at the same time, I can feel hope, gratitude, and compassion. At the same time, <clears throat> this acceptance and non-judgmental attitude enhances that sacred space that we're talking about that allows us to choose how to respond with self-compassion, resilience, and well-being. Yes, I can feel grateful and be disappointed about things being canceled. I can, I can be hopeful and feel like everything's falling apart. Good night, moon.
Good night, Zoom. Good night, sense of impending Zoom do doom. Well, when we do go to bed at night, try to count those three things that happened during the day for which you are grateful, and that will increase your well-being. And lastly, it's okay to fall apart sometimes. Tacos fall apart, and we still love them. Well-being is a life skill, and if you practice, you and your brain circuits will all get better at it. Thank you so much. And now I want to turn your time and attention up next is Dr. Jennifer Clark, and boy, do you have a treat. And she's going to talk to you about uh, uh, the quarantine and the circle of control. Thanks again. Um, okay, so you know it was it was great working with uh, everybody and planning for this. Um, total kudos to Wendy, meme queen for sure, and really inspiring us on this. And the way we were thinking about this because. Um, uh, I've actually taken care of a couple of patients with this, you know, kind of like psychological drama of the quarantine fatigue or corn, I can't say it. <laughs> um, quarantine fatigue is a real thing. We see it in medicine a lot when we have um, alert, like alarm fatigue. You know, you're in an ICU, you got things binging all the time. You kind of learn to live with this, but it takes its toll. And so, um, you know, really being able to kind of think about this in, in a couple different ways. And the framework that kind of stuck in my mind is, you know, you're on an airplane and all of a sudden the air cabin changes, you've maybe got some turbulence and the, the um, oxygen masks drop out. And as, as, you know, and as Jill was just talking about, there tends to be a two groups of people, the people that are like, oh, masks have dropped out, we need to do something. And then there's the people with their hair on fire, right? That are just like, oh my God, we're gonna crash. And so, you know, kind of really taking that breath and learning to kind of say, okay, I have a choice in how I'm gonna behave in this matter, you know? And so, you know, kind of, right, you know, kind of Jill has given us the idea about, okay, there's a mask that is here for me to kind of do something about, to kind of deal with this situation. What I'm hoping to do is to help you recognize that you need to place the oxygen mask on you first before you can help any small children or others who may need your assistance. So for your uh, next few moments, I will be your flight attendant through this process. So um, I wanna take you through three things that um, I've seen um, as ways as individuals that we can live despite and within COVID-19. So the first, you have, one of the things that's happening and Jill kind of mentioned it previously is that um, you need to deal with the decisions that you're making on a day-to-day -day basis. And in your care packet that Brittany sent to you earlier today, there was an article that was included by, um, uh, by a, uh, Dr. Kleinman, who teaches psychiatry, anthropology, and social medicine in Harvard. He's an amazing writer. Um, and the title of the article is called How Rituals and Focus Can Turn Isolation into a Time for Growth. And I was struck by the closing sentence that is in this article that struck me because one of the things that you have to start out with is a sense of awe. I mean, when there is a natural disaster, or a plague like we're dealing with right now, it really kind of, it has the opportunity to invoke a very high level of awe to recognize kind of how small we are in the world and kind of, you know, kind of our day-to-day -day, like living and wearing a mask that we'll talk about or that I can't go to my kid's football game or whatever it happens to be becomes very small when you start and step back and kind of say how awe-inspiring are, you know, kind of we're living through a historic time in humanhood, not just, you know, kind of our country or anything like that, but, you know, kind of humanhood will be forever marked by this period of time. So entering into this with a sense of awe, I'm going to read you the last line of this article that I would encourage you to read. It's a quick two, three minute read, but totally will impact you, is a plague. As Albert Camus knew, who's a famous philosopher, if you guys don't know, Albert Camus would recommend taking a look at him. He's got some great memes. 
um, is the, mo the moment to ask what life is for. So a plague is Albert Camus knew is the moment to ask what is life for? The response to COVID-19 suggests one answer, care for yourself and others. So take a breath and take the time to change the daily rituals that make up your life. Throw yourself into them as if your life were at stake, which it is. And so this meme, if you guys look at it, starts with wake up, read the bad news, eat, guilt, lack of productivity, more bad news from reading my bed, having nightmares and wake up and the cycle goes over and over again. We know this as doom scrolling is the new, <laughs> is the new term for this. And what we're finding out is that if you, if you read Kleinman's article and you actually look at the science, where people's contentment comes from is really paying attention, just like Jill said, to your daily life. Those mundane things like waking up, um, and as I was talking to one of my really good friends this today, is having a really good cup of coffee or making an intentional lunch or in the case of you know Jill and Jim taking care of their 19 month old grandniece and you know setting aside time nap time or play time and really making a ritual of your day because the concept of time is taking its toll on all of us and we're having to navigate so many choices that time has this paradoxical feeling of slipping away from us um, in a moment to moment notice but at the same time, like thinking about where we were in March feels like a lifetime ago. And so it's just this weird paradox. So learning to deal with your day-to-day -day decisions about how you spend your time and live with your time is extremely important and one of the things that's worth paying attention to. So make rituals out of the mundane because this is an awe-inspiring time. Okay, next one. <laughs> I love the Princess Bride, and I'm sure there are plenty of people on this call that do too. Um, so Wesley of the Dead, uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts masks are so very comfortable. I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. So the first, if the first part was about decision fatigue and really making wise choices, particularly about how you live your life within your home, this section is really about what we call source control. Meaning, okay, how do I handle talking and, and getting out of my house and taking the risk of going out into the world? And this is the simple things of the three W's. This is wear your mask. If you are going outside your home, wear a mask. If anybody has a question about that, I'm happy to talk to you. Wear your mask. Two. Those in healthcare, we always know where our hands have been, what they've touched, and we're constantly washing them. We're trying to impart that upon the rest of you. Always, always know where your hands are and have some hand hygiene ready and available. So, you know, quick 60% scrub or 20 second soap and water, you're good to go. So wear your mask, wash your hands. Now this third thing was watching your distance. You know, everybody's kind of numb to it right now. I, everybody tonight, I want you to measure what six feet looks like from you, okay? Because it's a lot further than you would think. And you need to create that, that you know, kind of comfortable, you know, what is it, our, our personal space needs to be six feet or more. And that's actually a pretty good distance. An easy way to do that for most adults is to have both of you stick your arms out. And if your fingers are touching, you're too close. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, if you're like my mom, who's five foot, maybe, that might be a little bit longer. But for most of us, if you stick your hands out and your hands are touching, you're too close. So get used to that six foot bubble. It's very, very straightforward. You have to develop the rituals and routine around the three W's of washing your hands, wearing your mask, and keeping your distance. The more you, you do that, the less decisions you have to make and the less decision fatigue and quarantine fatigue you will have. So just make rules about it and then don't think about it, right? So again, in your car, you're leaving your house, mask, hand soap, you know, or, you know, kind of some, some um, uh, sanitizer. And then just know, you know, get used to having that six foot distance. 
the thing is, is that when you stick to those rules, that means you, if you show up at a place and you're not able to practice those three things, you leave. Simple as that. You've got to make it very clear for yourself because the more you do that, the less fatigue that you will have. Okay, last thing, <laughs> um, for those of us who love Star Trek, um, is, you know, kind of we've talked about, you know, kind of your, your daily habits and, you know, limiting the number of decisions you have to make in a day, creating those source control habits. The third part is really about transaction or transmission events. So we have got to learn how to play in the sandbox. Because as we were just talking about, we absolutely need human connection. It is a fundamental part of who we are, just like food, water, and air, okay? We have to, it, it, it's required, you know, kind of, you get into the parts of the brain like the amygdala and its cousins in there. It requires other human beings in order to see ourselves. So we have to figure out a way to interact with each other. So including people in your routines, whether that be on the phone, electronically, and being socially distanced, or as many people are getting really innovative about this, is developing things called isolation bubbles, where families and friends have come together and made a commitment to each other, just like you would in your own household, of how you're going to behave when you are outside that safety zone, so that you can kind of, um, in good Oklahoma terms, circle your wagons and be in that community with each other so that we don't feel so isolated and that we can protect each other and we can each wear our masks so that we can help one another. So, you know, kind of, it takes all of us working together, being responsible about our choices, putting some rules in place, and lastly, you've got to have some trade-offs, okay? We cannot have our cake and eat it too. This is a time where you can really prioritize kind of what Kelly was talking about, the things that matter most. You have given, been given a gift, a gift. Yep, this thing is a gift to kind of sit back and say, what matters most in my life? Because now I have an excuse. I have an excuse to really prioritize the things that matter to me and let go of the things that don't. You know, we're constantly distracted um, and our minds have gotten so looped into those distractions that we can't deal with the time and the boredom that I previously was talking about. And then we, you know, get so lost in that we don't make the basic decisions about keeping ourselves safe and then God forbid we try and interact with, it, with each other. So, you know, do these real, you know, kind of basic, basic things of, limit your decisions, make rituals out of the mundane and your daily habits. Should you choose to kind of go outside your doors, do those basic things for you and I and the rest of us, wear a mask, wash your hands and keep your distance. And the third thing in community, find innovative ways to make deep human connections because we all need to be with each other. We just need to do it safely. So with that, I'm gonna hand off the next part to Wendy, who is about, you know, kind of you, how do you, you know, how do we truly help, help each other through mm -hmm. this, help lead each other through this? So with that, I'll hand it to Wendy. Thank you, Dr. Clark. I think Brittany's going to share my first meme. And so once you've got your oxygen mask uh, firmly on yourself, all of a sudden you look around and you go, maybe I can help somebody else. And so this is sort of uh, my opportunity to talk a little bit about um, how my organization and in my work, we're looking at leadership, service, and influence. So I love the Mona Lisa memes almost as much as I love the Princess Bride memes. Uh, so this is the four stages of the quarantine and maybe you have felt them too. Uh, I sent my staff home uh, to work from home on March 16th and we didn't return at all to the office until June 8th. 
Um, and at first when I got home, I did puzzles. Anyone who followed me on uh, Facebook knew I was doing lots of puzzles. And my goal for each day was to do one thing for work, one creative thing, clean something, because we were all about cleaning then, uh, and then connect with someone like Dr. Clark was talking about and try to keep up with some self-care. It was literally all I could handle. Other than that, I was seeking a lot of information and uh, I was definitely doing that doom scrolling that you just heard about. I got really good at that. Um, and then it took a minute, and uh, next slide, and I realized that at Leadership Tulsa, we teach resilience as a leadership capacity. And uh, I love this definition of resilience about um, returning to and maintaining your core purpose and your integrity, even when circumstances change dramatically. So what do we teach about resilient leaders at Leadership Tulsa? And you have these uh, items on the worksheet that we sent ahead. Um, resilient leaders recognize and accept tough realities, right? They're not Pollyanna. Um, optimism is important, but you have to be rigorous about what is. And during this crisis, part of it was understanding this is really serious and it could potentially get worse before it gets better. And so facing up to that fact. Resilient leaders are also able to make meaning out of setbacks and challenges. Uh, they create um, meaningful narratives, um, communicate that with the people around them. Uh, help people reconcile themselves to the situation and find the meaning within it. I know in end of life care through Claire House, so many people, even in the face of the most difficult life circumstance, find some meaning or purpose. Resilient leaders are good at adapting and improvisation. So that pivot and adapt we've heard so much about. And even those leaders who aren't actually naturally good at themselves will find people around them that they can lean on and tap into those um, abilities. And then uh, finally, resilient leaders monitor themselves for capacity and demand. So they know when to say yes and how to say no. They manage those energy systems you've been hearing about. So I realized if I teach this, how do I live it? Next slide. Yes, and um, Jill also shared this. I actually think this meme is the meme that began to give me a sense of control and purpose. Uh, so there were a lot of things I was worried about, not just the health pandemic, um, but the associated economic impacts and how those would um, impact my organization, my employees, my city, Tulsa, you heard Kelly say how much I love Tulsa. Um, and then short on the pandemic, there was political and social unrest. There was a social justice moment we found ourselves in. There's been a lot of incoming. And so I did take a look and actually made a list of, I make lots of lists, of the things that I could control. My mask, my social distance, the things I started to do differently like Jennifer was talking about. Uh, my food and exercise, sometimes controlled those better than others. Taking some vitamins, I don't know if it helped, but I started taking vitamins because I felt like I can control that. My vote, my political contributions. Supporting local businesses and charities with my money. Making a gratitude list. Yes, zinc and vitamin D. Um, a list of what was I was gonna do every day. I started to make a list every day of what I was gonna do all day long, no matter how mundane uh, the things I was gonna do. And eventually I got into sort of a rhythm of my days. And so once um, I got into that rhythm, I had the opportunity to look around and say, how might I be of help to others? And I quickly realized, and this is uh, another meme, but I couldn't find a really good one for it. it. We're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat, right? So my staff and my members who were parenting at home had different challenges. People who were taking care of uh, elderly parents had different challenges. If people had underlying health conditions. So everyone uh, was struggling in different ways and on different days, but the struggle for everyone was real. 
So I began to think if resilience is returning to a state of core purpose and integrity, and if part of my organization's purpose and my personal purpose is service and leadership, um, especially uh, there are guiding principles when we're at our best, um, I began to look around and to figure out how leadership and service could show up in my current circumstances. So for service, I ask a question, and it's also on your worksheet for you to ask yourself as well. And the question I asked myself is, what is my work to do? What is my work here to do? And um, obviously, it's true that all the work I had planned to do before this happened was obsolete or would at the very least need to be delayed. So I moved my entire life on Zoom, like a lot of you, and asked, what is my work here to do? So next meme. So uh, Jill, uh, Jill had a similar one, I think. Uh, good night, Zoom. I moved my entire life onto Zoom. Close to home uh, with my family and friends, I set up regular uh, Zoom connections with my Zoom room. I began to teach my friends and family how to use it. At work, where our mission at Leadership Tulsa is to identify, develop, and connect diverse leaders to impact the community through service, helping people gain knowledge, skills, and connections, I started a series of new online programs, including a weekly coffee chat with area leaders, uh, a job seekers network for people who found themselves out of work, um, some skill up uh, series. So how can we use the new tools? And actually found there was a gift inside of this because all of a sudden we have 87 people on tonight from the comfort of your homes or offices. And it's easy to connect this way sometimes. And I also connected with uh, my colleagues from around the country. And we began to share ideas with each other on how to navigate and pivot and adapt our individual programs. So that was my work um, that I saw that I could do, is how do I use this resource that I have and the connections that I have in the community to bring people into helpful connection with each other. And then with a leadership question, my next question was, how can I assert my influence? Because between your circle of control and the things that you're concerned about, there's this kind of wishy-washy space of who do you influence? And so I decided that I was going to become positive and helpful, funny and informative as much as possible. And around July 4th, I couldn't do that anymore and I had to take a Facebook break. Um, but I shared lots of messages of giving grace to each other because we're all suffering things and then really trying to help push the message of protecting each other. For instance, that wearing a face mask is an act of love. And uh, with my team at work, um, I really leaned into something called the results only work environment. You know, how can we survive and thrive working from home where everyone's dealing with different challenges, which is really keeping our focus on the results that we want to achieve and not being overly focused on um, the way, the place, the time of day that people do their work. I also started sending particularly helpful resources, at least I thought they were helpful, to people that were within my uh, uh, circle of influence. So because of my work, I know Dr. Dart, I know the mayor, I know a lot of city councilors, and yes, some of them got early morning emails from me where I thought I had a helpful resource to share. Maybe it helped, maybe it didn't. Um, but I was definitely behind advocating for the local mask ordinance. And, um, you know, just trying to use my social capital that I've gained um, to help people um, maybe break through some of the divisive rhetoric that's out there and get some good information. Part of understanding what is my work to do meant that I also had to let go of the work that was not mine to do, things that were not in my circle of influence. I decided that protesting and rallies were not for me. I probably didn't have any place impacting any sort of national policies. I don't have those kind of connections. I do not have any medical background, so I was not gonna be the one figuring out the treatments or cures. 
And I also had to let go of dictating the choices of others. And that can be really hard when it's people that you love, uh, people that you care about, people you're concerned about, but I can't manage the choices that others choose to make. And finally, you gotta go easy on yourself, right? We're all just doing the best we can. Um, just like uh, Jill said, it's um, possible to be simultaneously grateful for the privileges and advantages that are in my life and be okay with the feelings of grief and loss and anger because the losses we are encountering through all this are absolutely real. And so I tried to remind others of that as well. Uh, in summary, I finally came up with this phrase that was helpful to me and I called it riding the corona wave, right? Um, I would move forward when my energy allowed and I was okay with resting when I simply couldn't move forward. There were truly days I barely got out of bed and others that I was able to get a lot done. And I tried to be transparent with family, friends, and even my direct reports at work when I was struggling because I think that kind of transparency can be super helpful for people. Um, so you've got a worksheet from me. It um, highlights some of those ways that resilience is a leadership capacity. It gives you a little activity you can do with your family. Um, there are some conversation starter questions. And then uh, there's a place where you can journal. So um, I encourage you to think about what your work here is to do. And it's different for everyone. I have a dear friend who's an artist and her work during this pandemic is making these amazing colorful masks and selling them to benefit the arts organizations that she believes in. Maybe you're baking for your friends and family. You know, your work here to do is going to be as unique as you are. Um, so ask that question. How can you use your influence for good? Because you do influence people. There are people in your world who care uh, what you think and what you do and are going to be watching you. And then what narrative gives uh, my story or present circumstances meaning and purpose? So those are some questions to think about and they're on a worksheet for later. So with that, I think I turn it back over to Brittany to take Q&A. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jill, Jen, and Wendy, um, for your incredibly helpful presentations. Um, just a reminder to everyone, um, we did send that resource packet out um, on the second page. Uh, there are active links to uh, what they were talking about with the resources. Um, I encourage you to review those and work toward implementing some of those exercises into your day. Um, I'm also going to launch the second poll. Bear with me. And that has the questions about the program that we will use for grants. So please uh, take a little time to complete those. Um, now we are going to open it up for Q&A if anyone has any questions or comments. So just a reminder, everyone is on mute. Um, so please unmute yourself before speaking, or you can send your question or comment through the chat like people have been doing. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. We have a few minutes for Q&A. Um, it looks like um, there was a question to Wendy that asked if you would share the artist link. Love opportunities to support local. Yes, yeah, so the artist that I'm talking about is Jean Ann Fowser, who is a beautiful uh, fiber artist, and her masks are now on sale at the 108 Contemporary Gallery down in the Arts District. Okay, so again, just a reminder, everyone is on mute, or you can submit a comment or a question in the chat. Hey, Brittany. Tiffany, hi. I have a question for uh, Dr. Clark. So I know um, you were talking about the doom scrolling. And so I actually have maybe the opposite problem where I just avoid it altogether, right? I'm just not interested. I don't want to know what I won't, what I don't know won't hurt me. So is there anything you have to add or say about that? <laughs> So I think our tendency kind of along the lines of Jill's amygdala um, is that human nature is that we tend to gravitate towards one extreme or the other, right? So we're either, you know, kind of the whirling dervish that, you know, again, your hair's on fire or we're the ostrich and it's like, eh, I'm just going to be over here in the corner, 
you know, and for most of us, that's drinking our wine, right? And the world can go on doing their thing. Um, you know, and when you're finding, so one, you've already, the, you've done the first thing is recognize that I'm living at one of those two extremes. So, you know, not that either one are bad, I, they're just manifestations and you need to just be aware of where you are on that continuum. Why am I kind of there? What, you know, kind of, have I had too much exposure, you know, kind of thing? What's happened this week? Whenever you find yourself in an extreme, it allows you to pause to kind of say, okay, what's, what's happened? What, what's kind of gotten me here? Um, and then, you know, kind of, you know, kind of one, if you're in the doom scrolling situation, that's easy. You just kind of back yourself off. But if you're in the kind of more ostrich end where you're just kind of putting your head in a hole, you know, kind of pick one or two kind of good resources, whether that means calling your local friend or, you know, kind of a couple of resources that you trust, you know, kind of, you know, the things that you read, you know, kind of, you know, pick a magazine that you've kind of followed, um, depending on your per political persuasion, that may not be great, but it, you just you need to kind of pick one or two things that you consistently read um, or talk to someone that you trust to kind of engage yourself in, okay, what are, the, what are the current events of what's going on in my life so that you're not you know, kind of avoiding, um, because you know, overindulging and avoiding are kind of our two primary human sufferings. And you know, kind of when you find yourself there, it's time to kind of pause and regroup, so. Thank you. Comment from Melanie in the chat, practicing self-care, just lit my favorite candle that I never like because it's my most expensive, makes me smile. And I think those are really important things. You know, if there's something you've been waiting on, go ahead and do it. This is, uh, ben Linsky, I had a question. Um, so uh, like most of us, I started working from home in mid-March, but here I am in September and I'm at least working at home through the end of the year and, and who knows how long into 2021. Um, so it seems like I may have, you know, more ahead of me than I do behind me at this point. Um, what type of, what type of recommendations would you have for someone like me who, um, the, the uncertainty isn't there, but the, the known quantity isn't necessarily the thing that's uh, cheering you up day to day. Cause you know, I'll, I'll be stuck here in the, in the house for, for the foreseeable future. I, I do have one, um, suggestion. So one of the things that I have discovered is that we are missing out on those spontaneous accidental interactions that delight us so much. And so you really have to be very intentional about scheduling things even when there's not a purpose. And so something I've been suggesting to our Leadership Tulsa members is that they actually reach out to their class members and schedule a half hour coffee chat whether if they're not doing anything in person in a backyard or a patio, then via Zoom. And it doesn't have to be a meeting with a purpose, just to really have those human connections to Jennifer's point earlier too. But you have to put yourself out there because it doesn't spontaneously happen. I think, you know, kind of Ben, you've hit on a you've hit on a big point and kind of a little bit I touched on it with with the the you know kind of circle of doom that we saw with you know kind of that's happening with a lot of people that the mundane kind of cycle of life is happening especially if you're seeing the same four walls over and over again and there's this feeling of being kind of imprisoned um is you know kind of stepping out of that and you know kind of looking at your space anew and finding joy and kind of things in the in the day-to-day -day life that's obviously one of them but the other thing is you know pausing and kind of saying, okay, we need to not be in the, you know, kind of minutes and seconds mindset, um, you know, kind of in end of life care, we always talk about, are we in years to months, months to weeks, weeks to days, days to hours, hours to minutes, you know, how close are we, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, kind of the pandemic has really called us to kind of move away from living in the seconds and minutes that we do in our day-to-day -day lives and looking in the hours, weeks, months, and years and reframing that, you know, unfortunately with leadership constantly telling us that, you know, the, the solution's right around the corner, that's not realistic. You know, we are, you know, I'm here to tell you guys, this is the foreseeable future. I mean, we're talking years. And so, learning to kind of accept that, embrace it. This is an awe-inspiring moment. And what can I do right now to kind of 
live, live my life despite this, you know, kind of thing. And so shifting your framework of time, particularly, I think a lot of people are struggling with that, right? It's like, okay, I don't want to get used to this because next week things could change. We could get the vaccine and things could go back to normal. Well, that's not the case, you know? Um, and so setting some stability in knowing that um, and starting to build new routines um, and creating purposeful moments because we have been constantly bombarded with those lovely opportunities for our, you know, you know, kind of crossing people's paths and things like that. What this allows us to do is be very, very purposeful in how we spend our time. And we have to be because we have to create those moments instead of waiting for them to happen to us. And I, I want to add to that, um, referring back to Jill's amygdala, my amygdala settled down a lot when I gave up thinking about how things used to be and wondering when it was going to be like that again. Coming to the place where I can tell myself, we're never going back to where we were last January. Things are forever changed. And, and then finding a way to make the best of that. It helped me settle down a lot. And the leaders that were most successful during all of this were ones that began to look for where are where are the where's the lemonade and the lemons as opposed to we're just going to pause everything and wait for it to go back. Jill, the thing the thing I'm trying to work on and find for those that I love and care about is what can can you identify what brings you joy. Mm -hmm. And is it, what, what little thing can you do that brings you the joy? Now, you know, and it's easy to say, oh gosh, I really want to play the, I want to play, I want to play the harmonica, I'll, I'll just say it. And uh, uh, so I can get on YouTube and I, it just gave me a little joy. Now, why don't I do that every day, damn it? I did it, I did it for like three days and I was just, it really gave me joy and I should stick with that. So, um, you know, uh, think, I mean, think introspectively, I mean, I, I know, but, but it just, and explore what in this time, because you have, a, you have that increments of time that you get to fill in, you know, you didn't have 30 minutes at two, two o'clock every day <laughs> before, but you got two o'clock if you want to make two o'clock, you know, usually. And what could you do that would give you joy at two o'clock when you're feeling kind of blah? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, for end of life, you know, one of the things we've always gone in the pre-COVID environment was human touch. You hold their hand, you're at their bedside. Okay, so I have patients in hospice care now i'm walking in their room in a mask in a face shield in a gown in gloves i look not even human anymore and i don't feel like that human touch is the same have you guys come up with something to make it feel more human that i'm not coming up with <laughs> um i think so simply the power of intent is extremely important if you go in you know to a room understanding that you like you look like the spacesuit alien from back to the future <laughs> right um and be worried about that that's going to translate but if you go in with the intention that i know that you go to with every bedside during hospice it comes through irregardless of what plastic you may have between you and your patient so you know, your intention is to be present. If that means I have to be garbed up to be present, by God, I'm just gonna be, have, I'm just gonna do it, you know? And, you know, kind of my colleagues in palliative care, particularly in the hospital setting where they're having to do this on a routine basis, that's the choice. It's, I'm gonna go in there with the intention of being, just being present and having a human being in the room with them because that's better than most, what most people are getting. So I think mentally, you just, you know, kind of start fostering the power of intent and it translates in, in your human interaction. And, and one thing I'll add that I've talked to several of our caregivers here at Clare House about something that, that they will often do is um, as they're trying to establish a relationship with someone or when they've had a relationship and they just need that more intimate connection, they will 
stand back a safe distance, pull their mask off for a second and give them a big smile or mime a kiss or whatever that might be and put their mask right back on and just have to trust at some point we got to we got to be human and make that connection and and still try to monitor all those precautions as best we can but i think it's really hard for all of us to only see people from the eyes up and and we've hired people since this pandemic started and i've worked side by side with them for days and i don't really know what they look like if i met them in normal times, I would not recognize them because I've never seen them. So the ability to be like this on Zoom and be able to see our entire faces and those expressions and all the body language that goes with that is is important. And, and sometimes we just have to get a glimpse of that. Looks like we are um, nearing the end of our time. If anyone has any last minute questions or um, comments, feel free to um, Go ahead and ask those or put it in the chat. We'll stay on for just a minute. Um, we thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing in this conversation with us. Um, if you want more information or if you want to continue this conversation, you're welcome to send me an email and I can connect you um, with our presenters. I put my email in the chat, but it is B as in Brittany Smith at clarehouse.org. Um, and we just appreciate you joining us tonight. So thank you and have a rest uh, or a good rest of your evening.